So, uh, preachers, we uh, know that this has been a busy season for you, and we are so grateful uh, that you have uh, stayed with us and that you have been faithful in the communities where you have a sphere of influence. And we just want to thank you for the work that you do. We really think that good preaching changes lives. In some cases, it saves lives. And so we're grateful uh, that you're making the extra effort uh, during this season to, to preach well, to preach faithfully, uh, and to preach honestly. And now that you go into Holy Week, know that you are held with the love that Jesus talks about on that last night of his life, of love one another as I have loved you, that God holds you in that love, Jesus holds you in that love. And we are so grateful that you preach that love uh, to the people who need to hear it. So thank you for your thank you for your preaching and know that you are held this week as you anticipate the resurrection in love. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for Monday, Thursday, which falls on April 14, 2022, are from Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 4, optional 5 through 10, and 11 to 14, Psalm 116, 1 through 2, and 12 through 19. The second reading is 1 Corinthians 11. 23 through 26, and the gospel reading John 13, 1 through 17, and 31b through 35. Happy Monday Thursday. And to you. And a, a little foray now into John's gospel for today and for Good and Friday. For and Good Friday. And I'm sure you can find a way to preach it on Easter and then for seven weeks. There were seven weeks. So yes, we've entered into John. And I I do believe I say this every year, but I, I'm just going to do a little preamble and then go where I want to go this year. But uh, because what I want to do is point out a verse that's not in the lectionary. So what, of course, surrounds the love commandment, love one another as I have loved you, are these missing verses that are really key to the uh, poignancy of this moment in John and the the central act or the central focus of this last night in John if, of course is not the meal it's the foot washing this is not a Passover meal it is the foot washing and then and then Jesus uh, farewell discourse in the chapters that follow but the the verse that I want to point out is 1323 where uh, we have the beloved disciple reclining on Jesus, uh, which is omitted always in the, um, both, well, it was omitted in the narrative lectionary and also in the RCL. And I'm pointing it out because that's where I want preachers to put people. I want people, I want preachers this year, or this is where I feel I wanna be. I wanna be reclining on Jesus which is literally what that is on the breast of Jesus uh, or the bosom of Jesus. I want to be reclining there and, uh, and experiencing what the disciples are experiencing. I think that's what a sermon on this passage does. And this, that, that that verb is also the same verb that's used for Lazarus reclining on Jesus. And it's also in verse 28, which is also missing from the lectionary, uh, that now no one at the table knew while he, why he said this to them, uh, to him, but it's not no one at the table reclining there. And so we have this sense of the disciples uh, and, and this, the beloved disciple whom Jesus loved, got, you know, they're, they're reclining together. And in the midst of that, They've had their feet washed by Jesus, and but included in that, of course, are Judas, who betrays him immediately in, in verse 30, in verse 30, and then Peter, who will deny Jesus after the love, you know, after after the love commandment. And so that whole scene, I mean, that we miss so much about the poignancy of the moment if you leave that out, if you just focus on foot washing and love one another. That, that we're put there to imagine who are we 
in on this night? Are we are we the one who's going to betray Jesus? Which is is which Judas does. Judas doesn't betray Jesus by handing him over at his arrest. Jesus does that himself. Judas betrays Jesus when he leaves the room. He leaves the relationship. And then then Peter's own denial of his relationship with Jesus, uh, which is, are you one of his disciples? I am not. Are you one of his disciples? Is also foreshadowed. And so you have this sense in uh, verses 21 uh, through, uh, through 30 of uh, like verse 25. So right, while reclining next to Jesus, Peter asked him, Lord, who is it? And so that they're all looking around, like who 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 is going to be the one who betrays Jesus, and uh, and that's I think where we need to be. Uh, are we are we here? Uh, where will we be at the end of this? Are we are we going to um, are we going to stay in this relationship or not? That's what it means to betray Jesus in this gospel. And of course, the beloved disciple we next see the the beloved disciple not betraying Jesus, but at the foot of the cross. And so that's what this night is about. And are we going to stay reclining on the breast of Jesus and listen to his words that follow of farewell and what discipleship means and that you will be thrown out of the synagogue and the world will hate you? Uh, where will you be by the end of this night, which doesn't end with love one another as I loved you. It ends with Jesus praying for himself, for his disciples, because they sure need it and the disciples yet to be. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's, those are my thoughts so far. So add verses Is or there, to drop in there and yeah. You said you think that's where we need to be. Is that a, a comment on 2021, 2022, or is mm -hmm. that? I, I, it's both narratively kind of where I think we need to be, where John puts us. Uh, John really, you know, with the no name of the disciple who is a beloved disciple, and I've talked about this before, I think it's us, we're meant to hear ourselves there. But I think it's where we need to be narratively, but I also wonder if that's where we need to be now. Like what, where are we in our relationship with Jesus? Do we need to recommit to that or not? How has that been over the last couple of years? How do we think about that relationship now? How, where has it been, where has it been challenged? Where has it been uh, where has it been celebratory? Uh, where has it been the last five weeks of Lent? Where did, where will it be going forward? Uh, and uh, and 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 yet, you know, this reclining on Jesus on the breast of Jesus, that intimacy that Jesus invites us into, that's all a part of John, is what gets you know what the foot washing is communicating this abundant love that Jesus has. And are we going to accept that love or not? Uh, Judas doesn't. He, uh, he already has uh, rejected it with, with, uh, with Mary. He's already, he's already eschewed that love that he sees her, uh, her giving totally. Jesus. And now he leaves the building. He rejects that love. Do we have we rejected that love? Are, do we fully embrace that kind of love, the love that Jesus gives us and that actually invites us to love one another like that? There's a lot at stake being a disciple of Jesus. And uh, that's what I mean. Thanks for asking that question. That's where I'm at. I find that incredibly compelling, Caroline. Um, and I, I'm I was starting off um, uh, maybe cheating or maybe taking the easy route. Uh, um, my thought was, oh, to be known um, by love. Um, and um, I think those verses that you are causing us uh, are, are inviting us to center on and what they call out of the moment that this text is, is rehearsing. Um, um, might be the better frame for what I was thinking in terms of oh to be known uh, uh, by love. Um, as, as a preaching professor, uh, to be known by our practices, 
not our proclamation. Uh, so in a Twitter verse, not being known just for saying the right things for saying, you know, love, 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 but for actually demonstrating it and to demonstrate it. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to try and play with what you were saying, but to demonstrate it in such a radical way that it would cause those who would claim it to leave the room uh, and, and to, to, to not just uh, superficially um, um fall into the rituals, um, but to actually care for the needs of one another. And, uh, you know, I've said this uh, um, already uh, at, as, as we've moved uh, through this week, um, that uh, there are real needs out there uh, that need attending to. And, oh, to be known by the practice of love and not just uh, one of the one of the problems that people have with Christians or the church is that we we talk a good game and people never see it lived out. And what was so radical about, you know, everything that Jesus did was it was lived out. And then it got this language because how do I put words to that? And um, it, it's a hard word because it's a hard practice. Oh, to be known by that love. Um, so yeah, I, I'm compelled by, um, by moving into that space that we've avoided uh, as the way to get at what we might find to be a nice little, um, no pun intended, lovey-dovey text. It's mm -hmm. not, it's hard, it's radical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Thank you. Matt, you want to take us somewhere? Or? <laughs> I could take us somewhere. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have anything else to add on on John, except that it's, um, well, I guess I do, that the way you were talking, Caroline, about where we need to be now and the discipleship is serious business. And, you know, the we're in a society, at least a lot of Western society, at least where I live, where a lot of things are measured by effectiveness and numbers and quality and and as the church struggles that's largely a statistical um, assessment of the church's health and as if the, the way we're going to measure are we getting better are we doing better is also going to be statistical and that's just not anywhere part of this right the measure here is love and loving one another and what that looks like no matter how big the room is and that's you know, I'm not, I'm not naive to the importance of numbers and, and how that matters for keeping institutions alive. Um, but I do wonder what, what, um, <laughs> what metrics <laughs> based on love, or maybe you can't even measure love and that's the wrong way to do it. But just, there's something about this that calls us to a, look how simple it is. And of course, it's not simple to perform, mm -hmm. but simple to describe. Mm -hmm. So there's that. I would, if you want me to take us somewhere, we could talk about the Last Supper, which is not a Johannine thing, but is elsewhere. And here we get it in 1 Corinthians. And of course we get Exodus 12, which is the, um, the beginnings of the Passover. And the, the, the Synoptic Gospels present the, the Last Supper as a Passover meal, the first night of a multi-day multi festival. I, I don't know where to go with this, except you might do some instruction around the Last Supper and not necessarily where it came from historically. Uh, I, I'm happy, to, we talked about this before we started recording. I am happy to go on a long rant about why churches should not conduct Christian seders, not tonight, not any night, but that's maybe for another, <laughs> another day. But at the same time, Christians should celebrate communion knowing that it's a, a, a reinterpretation, so to speak, of the Passover event. Um, but I think for tonight, the most important thing is that it's, um, it is what the words of institution in, in 1 Corinthians 11 give us. And that's a text that's totally been decontextualized, right? Paul doesn't write to the Corinthians because he wants to fix their liturgy. He writes to the Corinthians because uh, they're being jerks and they've brought in from the world an unloving way of meeting together, which is the wealthy um, and the, the high status people get the good meal. They, they live according to the privileges the, 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 that, that their society has given them. And they, they reinforce the lack of privilege on those who don't have it. And Paul's saying, 
as if the meal is the worst of all possible places to act like that. Um, because, and then you get the words of institution, because you're not just eating bread and wine. You're not just, this is not an ordinary meal, nor is it something magically sacred necessarily. I, this is my own, um, my, my own sacramentology coming through, but it's, you're eating a meal that's instituted by Christ himself. And you're instituting a meal, you're eating a meal that is meant to declare a kind of radical unity founded in Jesus' own body and his own self and in his own vulnerability and death on your behalf. And so of all places, why would you use this supper to reinforce these class distinctions and these power distinctions? Why not instead rediscover what this meal means as a way of unifying people and bespeaking a kind of love? Now I'm gonna cheat and pull John into this, a kind of love for, for one's neighbor that's um, that's just crucial. So, you know, a lot of communion is very much individualistic between the celebrant and the, the person receiving. And I get that, that's important. But there's gotta be a way of thinking about communion that's much more of a unifying force, the thing that's pulling us together in these, um, well, in ways I, I don't dare try to describe because I'm not sure I can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that gets into the, what does it mean that this is, you know, done for you what does this mean that this is on your behalf and what 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 mystery we're walking in through in the next couple of days um is deeply a community building and a love building kind of um experience for his followers and hopefully for us particularly post-pandemic where um we weren't able to gather together and um it, it in, in some conversations, we talked more about the ritual and lost the reality of the genuine hospitality that was extended through the gathering together uh, at table, the gathering together of such diversity across, across the caste and class systems of the Greek and Roman society. And that's what Paul is speaking into. Um, what has been handed down is this breaking of barriers because of, of what God has given us in Jesus Christ. And uh, if, if there's anything that we should be uh, anticipating and gathering together now is what it means to get away from that individualism that we had to practice uh, because of the pandemic and to truly celebrate what it means to gather together across the diversity of our communities who all were longing to gather at table and that this is passed down to us um, in, 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 as, a, uh, as a preview of what God promises when Christ returns. And uh, uh, Caroline, not to, not to stop you from jumping in here, but, but if I turn back to that Exodus text, uh, I thought you were going to say a little something about, about, it, about it, Matt. Um, I... I I put this as a getting ready, and I use this uh, out of uh, the uh, commentary. I was just struck by celebration as prologue. Um, as a single person who ate a lot alone um, over these last two years, um, the celebration of a meal together, the celebration of, of, of what it means to come together and break bread as the pre prologue for all that God is doing in the world. Um, um, all that we are about to experience uh, as we move into Good Friday, as we move into the reality of the suffering, and then as we move into the reality of the power of life over death. Um, it starts with celebration. Uh, that's the prologue. I, I was caught by that, by that word in the commentary, uh, so. Well, it's, uh, it's a great word. Right? It's, it's Remember, the Passover is not Thanksgiving for having survived. It's no, it's, it's preparation right. for uh, for survival, yes. and it's a meal that is that is eaten with the sense of you have to do whatever it takes to survive this night, and and part of that is trusting in in God's provision. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate what you said about talking about the pandemic as well. This will sound creepy, but hear me out. Um, I love watching other people. Uh, receive communion like when I'm in church I tend to this because it just it, it it it's the best I can do in my own imagination to kind of create a banquet scene 
where there's a lot of people around. I love the noise of a loud restaurant when everybody's eating or a big dinner party. And I love like seeing people respond to their food and, you know, communion is a very different thing, but it's kind of like that, you know, and it's supposed to be something where you look around and think, well, I'm eating in the same room with these people. I guess I have to figure out a way to tolerate them (laughs) or maybe love them. And it's one of the things I think we've really missed in the last two years in the interest of keeping our neighbors safe, which I totally support, but um, not to be able to even watch somebody else for the most part partake in, in, in communion and not to feel their presence in the room mm-hmm. in a particular way with, uh, with you know, because we all make noise when we eat. There's, yes. you know, it's, there's something about that, that that pulls us together. And um, anyway, I don't know what that has to do with preaching on Monday Thursday, but I think it has partly to do with thinking about communion and what does it mean to love one another to have everyone in the room. I mean, if you're in a public place, um, even if that public place is a church sanctuary, if you're in a public place, there will be a diversity of people uh, beyond your immediate family. Um, And that is the extension that Christ invites us to table with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So yeah, yeah, I love that image and the noisiness of it.